terms of like other like 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 coaching organizations that have thank you counselor Test, test, oh, testing. Oh, yeah, we there. Test, test, test. Here we go. Steve to see where he is from our office. I don't know how well they'll get to it just because it's peak season, but you can put in uh, the carpet is filled a lot of cars. Good afternoon, everybody. It's 12 o'clock. So we will get started today, everyone. Thank you. We have Commissioner Julia LaFave here. We have Director of Chief Policy Officer, Chief Policy Officer Greg Lowe. I apologize. We have Counselor Allen. Councilor Driscoll, Ch Councilor Paniagua, and myself, Rashida Caldwell, and Greg will get started. Thank you. Good morning, uh, uh, Madam Chair and Councilors. Thank you for being with us this morning for this update on the city's tick and deer management program. Um, I, I, in addition to introducing Commissioner Julie Lafave, let me just note there are a number of people in the chambers today who are very important parts of the city's tick and deer management program. Um, over in the uh, uh, third row, uh, First Deputy Chief Rich Schaff from the Syracuse Police Department, from our Law Department, Mushtaba Tirmizi, uh, from our Parks Department, also joining uh, Julie Lafave, Casey Craig, uh, Ground Superintendent, uh, joining from the Mayor's Office, Liz Radel, and uh, also want to note that from our Citizens Advisory Group, uh, Ken Garno is here, a resident of the East Side uh, and one of the leaders of the citizen advisory effort that has been uh, occurring over the past three years as part of this program. And don't forget the guy's foot in the bill. We got Travis Glazier in the back. And as well. I'm going to note, don't worry, I wasn't going to leave him out. <laughs> and uh, our partners at uh, Onondaga County, Travis Glazier, and his colleague, uh, Brianna Kilkenny uh, from County Environmental Protection here, uh, also critical partners and uh, the primary funding source that we uh, work with for our deer management work in the city. So thank you all for being here. I'm gonna begin with a, a brief overview presentation. I believe everyone has copies, including obviously members of the council. I'd also note that you do have a hard copy of the USDA report, which was uh, issued at the beginning of June and sent to you all yesterday in advance as counselors. Today, I just want to briefly give an overview of the history of our deer management effort, the progress that we have made thus far. I want to be able to introduce some new, uh, obviously related to progress, the specific results of the 21-22 winter season. I also want to provide some new information today on the efforts we've uh, undertaken for data tracking efforts. To, to better uh, monitor progress on our deer management efforts, talk about our public education work, and then lastly, talk about uh, efforts for state legislation to address some areas of the city that continue to be very difficult for us to address uh, a severe uh, deer population issue. So that's what we'll cover, and without further, I'll, uh, I'll dig right into that, and uh, if you wanna flip to uh, the first of the slides on background, I'll cover this very quickly. Uh, this group knows that the city of Syracuse, along with other municipalities, continues to struggle with a significant overpopulation of deer by multiple factors over, um, over what is considered um, a, an acceptable deer population. In 2019, in partnership with the Common Council, in particular the uh, assistance of Councillor Driscoll, uh, but uh, the council, full council at that time, uh, we implemented uh, the first deer damage management program uh, in the city um, in, uh, at, that, that's ever occurred, and it happened in the winter of 2019 and 2020. We just finished our third season, and that's what we'll talk more about. In this past winter, there were also programs completed in Camillus, Salve, DeWitt, Fayetteville, and Manlius. I think you know on the next slide, uh, our purpose is to address the impact of the 
continuing problematic population of white-tailed deer in the city. There are three big categories of problems, and I want to point this out quickly now because there is no question that a serious concern is the public health matter of Lyme disease. Um, and we are all well aware of the growing threat of Lyme disease, and not only in the city, but in uh, the rest of the county and other parts of the nation. But that isn't the only problem that deer do create for uh, residents in the city. There's a significant safety issue with deer motor vehicle accidents. Mm -hmm. um, and we do have uh, the ongoing impacts on the ecosystem of vegetation impacts for both people's um, uh, gardens, greeneries in their yards, but also in our other public spaces. And there's, a, there's an impact that trickles down to erosion and other challenges with the population of deer. This is part of an integrated program that also includes public education. And I'll be pleased to share with you today more progress on data tracking. I'm going to try and now give a little bit more of a description about how the program is administered. Um, I hope it's helpful to get a feel for what we do. What I want to point out first on what I believe for everybody is slide four um, is uh, the site selection process is carefully monitored and regulated and uh, I think has been, been well executed and part of how we've been able to conduct a safe and effective program for three seasons. So any site used for deer management, also referred to as culling or deer removal, um, must meet really strict New York State DEC criteria. Uh, we have identified sites that meet that criteria on the east side, west side, and south side. These are the areas where we do observe the significant issues with deer. To understand the uh, criteria, uh, there is a requirement of no culling activities without written approval within 500 feet of an occupied residence of a property or uh, a commercial property. Um, and so you need written, uh, written approval from any property owner. Um, and there are limitations within 300 feet of a property of baiting activity. There are multiple sites in the city where we can meet that criteria. As noted in the second sub bullet on large private property or city owned properties, which are closed to public access whenever we conduct the work, which is how we are able to conduct this work in the safe and effective manner that it's occurred. Um, however, one of the continuing challenges we face with that criteria is there are still significant parts of the city where the nature of our uh, uh, infrastructure and where properties are located makes it virtually impossible to locate deer management sites. And so before we finish today, we're going to come back to this criteria matter and talk in more detail about the home rule request that the council approved and where we progressed with that during this past state legislative session. The program costs for this are shared with Onondaga County, shared by Onondaga County. Quite frankly, Onondaga County pays the lion's share of the cost of this program. And we'll, we'll cover the details of costs in just a moment. The work uh, must be executed by qualified USDA wildlife managers. Uh, these are trained um, uh, weapons, uh, firearms operators who are uh, specifically prepared for this work. Um, they work in coordination with the Syracuse Police Department. We provide public notice about the start of this program each year. I just want to note and remind the council and others in the room that public notice does not include specific disclosure of the sites where deer management occurs. Because we're able to do this in private property or public sites that are closed to access during those times, the experience in Syracuse and other parts of the country is that the safest way to conduct this work 
is with the proper supervision and use of technology without drawing more attention to those sites so that people might come there during the time that work is going on. Hence the reason Syracuse Police participates is to make sure that at sites where we need more coverage of people around to make sure everything is operated well, SPD is aware. We don't require SPD at all sites, only public sites. Okay. This work, I think you know, is done at night. Um, and it is done um, with the use, as I said, of uh, proper safety materials and equipment to allow that to happen. Let's talk about the results from this past winter. Um, so this was a return to a four-month season. Uh, the prior year due to COVID-19, the season was shortened to only a two-month period. Without any joy, uh, I report that 92 white tail deer were removed uh, from the city during this work. There is a, t a, a map to the uh, right on your slide that demonstrates uh, where those um, uh, removals occurred. Uh, 40 in the southeast quadrant, 40, I think there's, there may be a number error there that is very minor. It might be 41 in that. If I, I think it might be 41 in southwest, everybody. Just, uh, I'll double check that later, but I think it's 41 in southwest and 11 in the northwest. The total should be 92. I think the person speaking made a typographical error. Um, it just noticed it now. Um, we do not have any sites located in the northeast quadrant. Um, we have, we, we only choose to undertake this program in areas in the city where we see a significant problem. And thus far, we have not been able to identify uh, a significant problem in the Northeast. We do have some tools we're using now, which I'll cover, that are, that are tracking that for us, and we're not seeing the Northeast rising. Councilor Schultz, you uh, are a resident there and represent that area, and I don't think you're hearing a groundswell for work in that area. Not a groundswell. There is one family that lives on Sedgwick Drive. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, I will come, I'll cover a bit of, no, well, I'm going to cover a bit about what we're learning about different quadrants of the city through one of our, uh, our tracking methods. It's so dense over there too, like it's home. Yes. Oh. So it's going to be harder for them to kind of migrate over there. I think it would be a difficult part of the city to identify sites, uh, but thus far, uh, it, it has not reached the level and, and ideally, the efforts that we're taking here and other surrounding municipalities, we won't reach that point. As I said, take no joy in needing to report these numbers. This is a, you know, this is work of public health and safety that we need to do, and we, we choose not to expand it to neighborhoods where we don't feel it is of a critical public health and safety issue. Uh, the next uh, page is results continued, and it shows the um, history of removals over the past three seasons. Uh, the first season, not surprisingly, the most productive, followed by a shortened season in 2021, only two months, fully half the time period conducted in the prior season, and then 2022, 92. We consider these to still be, and our experts at USDA, who unfortunately, by the way, uh, our USDA representative was not able to be here today. We'll do our best on any questions. But the USDA continues to report to us that this is um, a, a productive program that is merits continuation. I noted already we returned to a four, uh, some, some other just uh, points about the program. We returned to a four month season. Um, USDA reported that there was minimal interaction with members of the public or property owners during the program. Um, that's an improvement from our prior years. We didn't ever have significant interactions, uh, but we did um, at, at, on occasion have some instances, and it does still occur, of people tampering with the bait, curiosity. Uh, sometimes they just see the baiting. And then there are those who are who are out, even in private property, even in public property, not many, but those experiences do occur, but the precautions that are taken and the training involved prevents any uh, issues from uh, those instances occurring. They reported to us those things were minimal this year. 
The total program cost for this season was less than we anticipated. We budgeted for a significantly higher amount than this in hopes that this year we would be successful in identifying additional sites and in particular in, uh, in achieving some changes in policy that would have allowed us to operate uh, in a different manner, closer to properties with approvals. We weren't successful yet in achieving those outcomes, so we operated in the same locations as we have previously. And the costs are directly related in the end. USDA bills us based on the number of deer taken. So it was $31,000. I noted the county reimbursement was, um, uh, what do we got there, everybody? Near, nearly two-thirds uh, of the cost. Uh, more than two-thirds of the course, cost, I think it is. Yes, more than two-thirds of the cost. Um, and uh, that's based on a new formula the county uh, introduced for all municipalities. Uh, Travis will catch me if I, if I get it wrong, but I think I'm correct in saying that the county for any municipality conducting a program will pay a uh, amount up to $20,000 as a base plus 30% of any costs over $20,000. And that's what this represents. We did continue tick-borne illness, uh, public information programs in 2021 and 22, despite the pandemic. <coughs> We're rounding the bend here as I move into the recommendations from this year's program from USDA, and then I'll start to cover some of the new information also today about uh, tracking and public education. Uh, USDA continues to recommend the identification of additional properties to in increase overall coverage. Specifically, uh, to note, the, the areas of the city, and many in the room may know this, that experience the highest population, deer population problems are still on the east side. Mm -hmm. uh, as Councilor Paniagua noted, uh, the east side has some of the same characteristics of dense, pop, uh, dense population um, and uh, a difficulty in identifying locations under the current requirements. So. What we hear anecdotally from the public at City Hall and at the mayor's office is a mix. We hear mostly calls now that say, this is great, we see fewer deer. We still hear from members of the residents of the city on the east side who report no change or a worsening in the conditions, more deer. Ken Garno, who is here from our advisory group, is probably one of those by show of hands. Ken, has the condition changed in your property? Yes or no? Gotten worse. Gotten worse. I, I second it. 13 deer in our front yard two months ago. Oh. Yeah. If this is a city property, think about that. 13 deer in your front yard. Okay. Yeah, and to, if, I, if you don't want me to so chime please, in, Greg, please. Uh, what we know about deer is that they tend to graze the same mile or so area. Mm -hmm. So they, if they find an area that they call home, they stay, they don't just, you know, they're not on the west side one day, the east side the next day. They tend to stay, you know, a little area where they make their home. So in these kind of areas near Ken's home and, and some others on the east side where we we need to be 500, was it 500 yards, 300 500 yards? Feet. 500 feet. And, and 300 feet from, um, from a residence and, and 500 from the street. Um, or is it vice versa? 500 residents, 300 from street for baiting. Yeah. Uh, in those neighborhoods, we're just not able to locate a site that works. And so it's really a challenge to get to some of these hardest hit neighborhoods in the east side where, like you say, it's densely populated. There's a lot of streets, a lot of residents around and these deer. So even though we remove, you know, we get 92 this year, some of those areas like Ken's talking about we'll see an increase or, you know, have no effect until we can get to some of those, get some more sites set up in some of those harder to hit areas, particularly around like the Nottingham High School area and the, the near east side. It's bad over there, Greg. I live over there. Yeah. I have like five in my you yard. You still see them. Every yeah. day. Like yeah. a family. Um, my other, as you move forward, you're probably going to touch this, but I mentioned it before in a parks um, meeting. I'm concerned that at Mountain View Park, um, I saw tons of years yes um and we know kids are playing there so that's yeah. just like yep. they're in the grass they're playing baseball they're playing there so i don't know what being that we know that's an area where there's a large amount of deers what can we do to spray the grass do something we have to do something over there 
because I've seen them. I mean, a lot of them all the time. Mm. Uh, uh, Councilor Schultz, just allow me to say one thing quickly. Uh, Commissioner Lefebvre did report to me that the Parks Department also does receive calls about reports to various parks, Homer Wheaton mm -hmm. probably one of them at various points. Mm -hmm. Councilor Schultz. To that point, so where do constituents call? Because I've had people ask mm -hmm. and they call City Line and City Line says we don't, we don't do anything with deer. So should they know that or should well, we just- First of all, um, I will correct City Line because City Line, I, I do need that, thank you. I wasn't aware that that was the information coming on City Line. If we're getting reports to City Line, Liz Radel and I would really like to get them. Okay. You. Yes, parks is a good place to call because uh, from an operational standpoint in city government, parks provides the oversight and coordination with USDA on the completion of the work. The mayor's office handles coordination with our intermunicipal partners because this is one of those issues that s municipal borders uh, don't have any, uh, there's no regard for municipal borders, so we need close cooperation and the citizen advisory work, which includes our tracking. So I, I do want to get that information. Thank you for telling me. We will make sure that uh, City Line, Liz, if you could make sure you assist me with City Line, that they know that those concerns about deer should become, come to you, and you and I will take it from there. And then we'll collect any data from parks as well. Thank you. Um, USDA has recommended to us that we consider trapping methods. There are safe and effective trapping methods uh, that can be used. They, um, there are differing viewpoints on the use of traps. Um, there is, uh, it is an area worthy of further review. And my recommendation to the council and to this committee is that it be one of the subjects that our advisory group take a look at over the course of this summer and consider whether or not we want to expand f with the inclusion of trapping in our program. How does the trapping work? Do they trap them and keep them alive or do they trap them? Correct. The, the animal is trapped. There is the, the primary method by which this is done is there is then um, a uh, notification that goes to USDA, a crew responds and euthanizes the animal. It's hard to it, it's it's hard to say clinically, uh, but uh, but I I say it with 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 respect for that and the recognition always as I point out is as I think you all know because you, you're here and you're interested in this issue, we're dealing with a countervailing public health and safety issue we have to address. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, the you know taking the deer from the trap and releasing it somewhere else is, violates the uh, state regulation as well. Oh, yeah. We're to go extremely far because yeah. they'll just come back. Right. They'll, they'll, they'll just back. come back. It's passing the problem to another municipality. Yeah, and then, you know, DeWitt and as, as we noted on earlier pages, DeWitt and all these other areas have their own programs, so we'd be, you know, just dumping our problem on their doors. <laughs> but, but, yeah. Later on in the presentation, but the animals went off the reservation. Yeah. Oh, I overlooked. Uh, I think I should have. It, oh, it's, it's still. Oh, it is. Yes. Oh, thank you. Ted, if you'd like to come to the mic, you can always. We like, we like to, you know, yeah. we, we have to stream these online, so we like yeah. for a committee meeting. We're more than glad. I, just so everyone understands, the advisory group from the beginning of time included trapping in the plan. It's in the plan. I don't think the other towns have it in the plan. What it does is it eliminates the need for the 500 foot rule for discharging a firearm because they don't use a firearm. They euthanize the deer the same way they do cattle. If you were at a slaughtering plant, they shoot a bolt into the head of the deer. Uh, I know that some of the anti-culling people want to show you pictures of deer thrashing around inside the trap. According to our USDA people, uh, that's not what happens. The deer go in there to eat. They have their cameras on. They know when they go in there. They go there, they take care of them, they put them on their sleds, and they take them out just as they would as if they had shot them. Yes. Yeah. Any, any 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 site that was used. Yeah. The homeowner's permission is needed. 
and it's, we would and, need and to, it's done in writing. Travis would make sure he, he checks me on this, but it would need to be part of our permit request with DEC. So there is a responsibility on the city, correct, Travis? If, if we were to execute any trapping methods, it would need to be part of our permit request to DEC. It has never been. Do you think? All right, we'll, we'll, we'll confirm that. I will say that our DEC permit does specify the method we're using. Yeah, but yeah, this I, would, I this would enable us, to, as I mentioned, that problem of, of the density of the east side not being able to get to all the homes. This would remedy that problem. Um, yeah, understand, unless your property is deeper than 300 feet, it can't be used yeah. because there's a 300-foot rule from public roads for baiting. So, for instance, this year we had a lady on the west, east side whose property is like six or 700 feet deep with all woods at the back of it. And we were given a map by the USDA and she and I went door to door. There were 19 houses we had to visit, including hers. If we got no any house, we couldn't use it. And we got two no's. So, if, so, it, if, so if this lady let us use the trap and we wanted to use the trap, we could have we could have taken deer at her yard this year what's the safety implication for the traps because obviously you know kids could walk in and hit a trap is there signage is it fenced in i actually don't have direct experience with the trapping to give you a, an informed answer so i'd rather look into that and make sure i report to you but the traps are obviously um uh, arranged to handle the animal uh, i'm sure there are safety precautions but i i don't have the experience to answer that yeah not to um you know, uh, speak for Justin, because I know Justin's the one who has the ultimate knowledge, but for, for example, when they do uh, all these other, um, all these other locations in the city, they have a system of cameras to ensure if someone passes a line of sight that, you know what I mean? So it's, there's not people wandering into it. So I'm, I'm guessing that they would have some similar protocol to, to ensure that the trap would not, you know, be, uh, be available for children. And I hope you know the difference between a deer and a dog. Right. Yes, okay. yes, absolutely. I mean, these guys, w w when we when we met with them, the level of um, uh, detail they get into is, is pretty insane. They, they, you know, they never they never fire unless they absolutely have identified the deer. They've got a clear shot. They know who it is. And at the end of the night, they are responsible for uh, identifying every single bullet. So it's not like they can yeah. just you know like a normal hunter can just shoot four or five, they, they have one shot, it's gotta be a clean shot, and they have to you know, tell us where the bullet yeah. went. I was gonna add on that, because during the season, the communication comes through the Parks Department, as well as a few others, but yeah, they are responsible if they miss, like you said, if they miss, or if they can't track the deer, if they lose sight of it, whatever, they are required to, to contact us, and they have had no issues. Yeah, they don't I think they don't that's important to they... note, I think it's important to note just as you guys talk with residents, whatnot, because especially the first season, we got a lot of phone calls after the press release, and they said, oh, they missed last night, and the deer's dead in my street. No, that was either a deer that got hit by a car. It was it was not related to this program. Yeah. So has, have you had cases of people taking these in their own homes? There, there have been instances that we've observed in the city of people hunting illegally for right. deer in the city. Um, and those cases we report to DEC, which is responsible for enforcement for illegal hunting. But we do see that it's very dangerous. Uh, and we, we've been able to identify instances because some of the sites where we are able to conduct work, where we have come across evidence of uh, illegal hunting occurring. Do we have any data of the line disease tracking in the last couple of years of that? I'll come to wh what we're working on on that sure. point before we close in data tracking, okay. if that's okay, Counselor. Yep. Yep, that's okay, um, there's a slide uh, called additional properties, which I'm gonna pick up on now, which is the legislative effort that we are working on with the assistance of our advisory group and the assistance of uh, the USDA to uh, create a pilot program for the city of Syracuse with the assistance of Assembly Member Hunter and State Senator May. Just before the close of this past session, legislation was proposed for a Syracuse pilot that would help us with areas that are still seeing high deer encounters, 
but are hard to reach, some of the neighborhoods that we've talked about. Under this provision, it would, uh, the, we would require only, restate, we would require notification uh, of property owners by certified mail within 500 feet. We'd require written permission, the state would require written permission uh, to work within 250 feet. So what that does is it effectively cuts in half the setback area that is, is required and would reduce the difficulty in finding suitable properties. There are properties that we can accommodate with 250 feet more easily with fewer adjoining property owners needing to provide permission. And that would then meet the state's criteria under this Syracuse pilot, which is, would be aimed for a three-year program. Our citizens advisory group has pointed out to us and Ken Garno pointed out that this legislation, which was not enacted, was not acted upon before the close of session, progress that we have legislation, next progress will be getting it approved, um, and, and uh, the difficulty still to be overcome is the setback requirement to streets for baiting activity, to reduce that further. So I'm pleased, I'm, we are appreciative to Assembly Member Hunter and Senator May for their help in trying to move this. Uh, both their offices have been attentive to this constituent issue um, and have helped us move this part forward now. Okay, last couple of points that I wanna cover. There is um, a public education program that is ongoing year round. Uh, our Parks Department works closely with uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension of Onondaga County, which is another support that the city receives through funding through the county. The county funds Cornell Cooperative Extension work on tick-borne illness prevention. And so we have a, a, a close working relationship with CCE. Uh, Parks was able to conduct four different tree ID and tick walk programs at city parks in 21 and 22. And importantly, one of the public education steps that we can take that helps us too is, you all know we have many city employees who work in our neighborhoods. Uh, and so in 21, we conducted training for our uh, public educa or education for our city employees. And we will be repeating that in the spring and summer uh, this year. Oh, we just did it. I thought it was still to come. Oh, I missed it. We did it this spring. I didn't go. Too soon. Too soon. Yeah. It gets good attendance and the employees are appreciative. It's really important. Last three slides. One of the recommendations that you said, this is data tracking. One of the recommendations that came from USDA and has year in and year out is to uh, improve and invest in our data tracking efforts. This is a challenging part of the work, everyone, because uh, Deer population counting is an extremely costly endeavor. It would eclipse the cost of our removal efforts to actually do population counts of deer. Um, and so we need to seek other methods to try to measure this within our abilities to execute in an ongoing manner. There are four methods that we either have underway or are making progress on. The first is we have a team of citizens who uh, complete deer diaries, pardon the play on words, uh, but um, they submit a monthly report to our advisory committee of what they have experienced and observed in their neighborhoods. This is still a small group. And so this is, um, it's, there's less than 10 people that we have who have volunteered to come forward to do this. It is far from being scientific but it is starting to give us some guidance. So for example, we have a couple of members in the Northeast quadrant, and we've only seen over the course of deer diaries among these two members, two reports of deer have come in over these roughly six months or so. Does not include the neighbor that you mentioned on Sedgwick, who I would like Councilor Schultz to see if they... Uh, oh, good, I like that. Yeah, I'd like to have that... Um, and I'd like to reach out to them and ask them to join our Dear Diary team if they're willing. We're coordinating with Onondaga County and CCE right now and um, Councilor Caldwell, this is the one that speaks directly to your point about um, 
tick-borne illnesses, there is an effective program that is operated at Upstate uh, University Hospital at the Thangamani Lab, uh, which is a uh, focused research center operated by Upstate on tick-borne and mosquito-borne illnesses. And uh, the Thangamani Lab collects samples of ticks from residents um, and uh, they are any encounter with a tick, they request that residents send it. They uh, check it for whether or not it has signs of Lyme disease, and then they record that based on the area that the tick has been found. Um, this would be helpful to us to track data very precisely in the city because the information can be broken down by at least zip codes and probably census tracts. Uh, zip code information would be helpful to us to have uh, so we could, we could start to see whether we, s we will be experiencing reductions in tick encounters. I can't necessarily say this is actually tick population numbers, right, because this is measuring encounters. Um, but it we'd be able to observe if there are reductions in tick encounters. All the experts tell us um, that we should be realistic about how long it will take for us to see reductions in tick populations and tick encounters. This is gonna be a many year process um, that um, uh, we, we should not anticipate that the data over the past three years has yet begun to show us any reduction in tick encounters. We'll take seven, 10 years of effort uh, consistent before we might start to see those uh, kinds of developments. So back to what I was saying, is there any way we can, especially the properties we own as a city, like the parks and yeah. stuff, and we know there's a lot of deers, is there any way we can do some spraying or making sure that, you know, people are safe on that, because we know there is ticks, like yeah. we know the deers are out there, um, to sort of try to keep it under control in those areas. I am not aware of, and I'll, I'll um, maybe lean also if Travis from County Environmental Protection can tell us, I am not aware of any preventative spraying methods that are enacted by municipalities to address tick prevention. Do you know of any, Travis, tick prevention spraying in public spaces? I don't know of any. I think that the pesticide you use is a very uh, general pesticide that will remove all ice and seeds and so in spraying the area that they're very localized applications. Can I first? Yeah, yeah, please. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks, Travis. Go ahead. Thanks, Travis. Um, Travis Glazier, Onondaga County Office of Environment. Uh, one thing to consider, uh, we've talked to some of the municipalities about it, is a tick tube giveaway program. So um, tick tubes have uh, permethrin uh, with uh, permethrin soaked cotton balls inside of them. You place the tubes in places where mice and small rodents would get to them. They build their nests with the, the cotton from this tube and that um, inoculates them from the ticks. The other part of the um, ticks life cycle is a small rodent. And so you try and decrease the Lyme disease, but it's a very localized application. So this is the type of thing you give to residents so for example, your instance with residents who are concerned, um, being able to provide residents with these tick tubes, maybe it's something you can apply to some of your parks um, to be able to, to do that. But in lieu of a general spraying um, application, which again, I, I haven't seen any uh, municipal applications of that nature, um, tick tubes are, are the kind of general uh, protective, purpose, uh, protective process. No, go ahead, you might answer the question. I was going to say, it's not necessarily the most exciting, but we really need to focus more on the education piece because with the per permethrin, <coughs> you can apply it to your clothes, right? And it lasts a, a number of washes. Like if we somehow educated the people who go to those parks, even their jerseys, let's say they're always there in baseball, it, it, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but if you treat that jersey with the permethrin, which is very cheap, right, and it lasts many yeah. washes, <coughs> it provides some sort of protection when you're out in those areas. And using a deep-based... Um, uh, spray for your skin and exposed parts is so, the other recommendation. There are alternatives now which the CDC recommends. I think um, there's a, a like a lime mix. It's a non-pesticide um, or non-DEET is 
I think a concern for some folks. There's an alternative to DEET, which is now recognized by the CDC, but generally just as a um, rule of thumb, DEET is a is what we recommend right. for somebody so, to spray. So I think so it's more of an education piece that we have to do a better job educating these families, or even if we <laughs> do more at the community centers or reach out to the little leagues, the whatever groups are organizing in our parks, it, I think that's going to be a key piece. So just so I understand, you're saying there's no sprays or anything that is out there that they use for the grass or anything? Not that I'm familiar with. I'd have to talk with our health department to verify that, but uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't believe, because again, I think that the spray that you use is, it will kill everything. And so okay. it's a kind of too broad of an ecological impact. <laughs> okay, thank you. Cornell Cooperative Extension is not able to be here today. They've had some staff turnover with our representative on this work. We will have new staff assigned to us and Julie has already, Commissioner Lefebvre has already committed that we will resume our public education partnership with CCE mm -hmm. and try to uh, do exactly what, what Commissioner Lefebvre said, which is personal protection is what is considered the, the best practice, mm -hmm. but hard to do, right? That's a lot of people to educate mm -hmm. um, and it's a, it's a challenging undertaking. Mm -hmm. one, or, one other thing that could five? be one other thing that could be mentioned is with the Thangamani lab. Um, it's an after it's happened, but a peace of mind is that anybody that finds a tick on themselves or their family members or their children or their pets, you can take that tick and send it to the lab and they can test it to see if it has Lyme disease. So it's a little bit of a peace of mind to know that if you have been bitten, whether you can or can, sh should or should not perhaps seek treatment for that. Um, and it's, it's, you'd have to discuss that you know, with your doctor and, and the lab. But that, that is a resource in the community that is free that people can send the tick there and have it evaluated. That also helps with our data, but it helps with the familiar peace of mind. Do you know how long it takes to, to get an answer? I, I, I don't. Um, the lab would probably be able to tell us. I can get you the answer to that. So in our parks, is this posted anywhere? Like if, I'm, if my mm. children are up at Homer Wheaton for a baseball game and they get bit and like how would they know? Most people don't watch these meetings, so they're not gonna know that information just gave them. So how do we communicate? We do have some generic signs that just say ticks may be present, but that's definitely a good suggestion that we should we're doing an inventory of all our parks anyways and signage, so this we should we should. Um, and I think there's already some there's specific signage already available. I will look into it. Because I wouldn't know as a parent, yeah. I wouldn't know how to deal with ticks with my kids, so mm -hmm. I wouldn't know where to go. It's is it Thang Thangamani Lab. Thangamani Lab. Thangamani Lab. Let roll off the tongue, huh? It's an easy website. It's just, I'll look it up, but it's, it's catchy tick videos or something like that that is the resource and everything. Maybe we. Go ahead. No. Like the Syracuse website, the city of Syracuse yeah. website. You make a little tick area so that you can have all the resources there at one stop shopping, including the county. Yes. Has the county has a good, we should reference that the county has a page already for it. Or do like a little tick tip yeah. or something that yeah. people can just click on and find Find a way to get people to the right information. I think also um, just, you know, this tick, um, Lyme disease is very, very serious. I know several people that are close to me that have Lyme disease. Um, um, and it can be deadly. So one of the other things that we can do is try to join forces with the school district and just educate the kids. Say, hey, if you see this, just know it could be a tick and this is what you need to do so that they know what to do. Cause I don't even know, you know, like what, you know, Council Allen said, so we can educate them about this. So it doesn't, you know, affect them as so much, you know, with the kids playing. Cause it's good that we're seeing the kids now more in the parks, right? But we also need to educate them of the things that they, they do see not to touch. It's not something to play with, you know? And those things so we can join forces with the school district and make that a part of something educational wise that they talk about and teach them we do engage with the uh, new fairly new nonprofit group focused on the uh, tick-borne illness uh, mm -hmm. education I hope I get it right today it's the Central New York Lyme task force I think is the proper name of the group um, and it has uh, it, its sole purpose is around the issues of education, uh, or primary purpose is around the issues of education. Some information from them just yeah. a, couple, a couple of weeks ago, maybe last week. It's a good group. A, and they have Spanish and English already out there. I, I asked if, if you know they were planning to release in any other languages, 
It's good. Uh, and so, you know, I, in, at least with the Spanish population, I can help them out, distribute that, because of course it's Spanish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the other language is the one we need to figure it out. Hey, Julie, with the signage, um, I know at Onondaga Lake Park, they have the sign that's about the not eating the fish in multiple languages. Is that something that we would want to consider at the parks, is to have ticks maybe present, but in multiple languages yeah. and yeah. predominant languages? Absolutely. That would be very nice. Anything else on that issue? Otherwise, I'm going to cover two more points on data tracking, and then we'll wrap up. Um, parks has worked with Cornell Cooperative Extension to to um, on a, a technique called uh, AVID testing, which is uh, assessing vegetation impact of deer, uh, and it is uh, to create a enclosed space where where you're able to determine um, because deer can't get in what we're losing for vegetation and uh, variety of vegetation. Thus far, we have not been able to locate a workable site in any of our parks where we can complete, uh, conduct an AVID test. Um, I think we're gonna need to look at potential private partners to be able to do that. Julie looked pretty exhaustively with CCE, but we would like to be able to conduct vegetation impact testing uh, that is assessment that is beyond just what we hear primarily anecdotally from residents who experience frustrating uh, and then of course as the animal is attracted to the vegetation it leaves behind uh, the tick and the resulting <coughs> tick illness. Importantly one of the pieces of data and I, I want to in particular acknowledge um, Deputy First Deputy Chief Shaw for his assistance we have been able to uh, assemble uh, deer motor vehicle collision data from uh, the uh, local uh, law enforcement uh, databases. Um, and so what you're looking at on the slide marked data tracking deer motor vehicle collisions, there's two slides we're gonna cover here. First, overall uh, instances in the city of deer motor vehicle collisions stretching back to 2019, that's really covering the year before our program began. Uh, oh, actually, excuse me, that's the first year. That covers 2020 when we took, there were 76 deer removed um, and there were 48 motor, deer motor vehicle collisions. In 2020, which was a pandemic impacted year, so travel may have been less, we saw m more deer collected in that calendar year and a significant reduction in deer motor vehicle accidents. In 2021, we saw deer motor vehicle accidents inch up a little bit uh, while we continue to see more deer collected, we think that inch up is probably related to a couple travel habit issues that, that mm -hmm. caused 2020 to be inordinately lower. We're still looking at um, this data and we'll continue to monitor it over the long term to see how it can help us. There are many factors that impact deer motor vehicle collisions. So again, we're talking about a metric that isn't perfect, but helps us. As you look to the map, I think this is interesting to see in the areas based on our work on quadrants. In two of the three quadrants that we conduct deer management work, southeast and southwest, we have seen an overall reduction in deer motor vehicle collisions. The numbers aren't monstrous, but we're seeing a trend that is encouraging. Um, in the Northwest, however, we've seen deer motor vehicle collisions have gone up. We're gonna have to watch that and see, is that a trend we continue to see in that area? Our Northwest collection efforts have been good, but not as strong as Southwest and Southeast. So this is information that will be interesting to track. And again, it's an appealing piece of data for us because we do have the information, Chief Schaff, it does take some effort by Chief Schaff and his team, but they are able to, and I think you got the system worked up so it's a little easier now to monitor it. <laughs> you want to? It's worth talking about quickly. So my team is me. Um, <laughs> I, I do, there are people who do the data and whatnot over at the PSB, but I found the most accurate way is to go through each and every deer accident report 
and to read it and see if it was, in fact, a deer accident report or if the deer was hung up on a fence or all these different things that could happen. So um, that's where the numbers came it's from. It's a manual process still. Manual process. Uh, I feel that they're uh, very accurate, but it is a manual process. Okay. Thank you, Chief. So it's data we can get because we get rich to do it. <laughs> Thank you, Chief. Okay. I'm going to wrap up with the next steps. Um, we will reconvene our tick and deer management advisory group. Um, I will be making an inquiry of counselors to help us in identifying any residents that you might know of that might be willing to join in the group. Uh, the group has been a dedicated bunch, but they've done three seasons worth of duty and could use some tag team help. We will continue the public outreach. We are continuing to build our tracking steps, as you've heard about today, tick density, deer damage, public education, um, and um, deer motor vehicle. Um, and we will complete any updates necessary to our management plan and report back to the council before uh, early fall so that you can authorize our continued work in the upcoming winter season. Julie. And you will notice on the next upcoming study session and agenda, uh, you will see me coming up to request authorization to enter into the IMA with the county for the, this year's reimbursement. My last point is just to note that when I do send that inquiry for citizen participation, I'll, I'll note this in my message, we do need citizen participation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's important for any long-term public health initiative like this that we continue public input um, and, and encourage um, everyone to know what we're doing, why we're doing it, and how it's going. Mm -hmm. Quick question. Um, we noted the number of deer that were culled over that timeline. Do you have a sense of how many deer are out there in this area? Um, so I, I, we don't have a, a specific population. Ken, Ken's going to give us a shot. Let me just uh, let me let me make a note. We know that I, I've been working on this for seven years. When Professor Underwood, Dr. Underwood, did a study on the east side in Dewitt, which is probably now six years old. He and his students estimated that we had 50 deer per square mile in that part of the city. In order to reduce the tick population, it should be 10 deer per square mile. Understand that when a female deer is one year old, they start having babies. They typically have two or three a year. And so you can see geometrically that our 50 per square mile on the east side now is probably 70 or 80 per square mile. And the only way to get it down is to remove more of them. That's the key metric that I was going to try and, and, and get to. So, Ken, you had the better number than I did. That 10 per square mile is what we do here is where you've got to try to get to to see sustained reductions in tick-borne illnesses. That's a, that's a hard measure to get to and because uh, Ken is right. We are many multiples over that current guidance uh, in the city, and um, we need, as I noted, It'll, it'll take a while. But actual deer population tracking, like Professor Underwood did, is an intense process uh, that we, we are not able to execute right now. And very expensive. We spent yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars over the last decade monitoring the deer. And the, the first time we did it, and then the second and the third, we just kept seeing the population increasing by 10, 15 deer per square mile every time we did the test. And then eventually we were able to get over that obstacle and get to the to the calling because the the you know we definitely um you know had many people advocate for different uh methods to deal with this but this is you know through extensive research going through this again and again this is the only method that works and to to ken's point as well um we'll see the number of ticks be kind of static from if there's 50 or 60 deer per square mile or 70 or 80 uh, until we get to that under 10, then you start seeing the, the, the e it hits a tipping point where the ecosystem for the, d for the tick starts breaking down once you get to under 10 per square mile. So like you said, this is a 10 year commitment from, we knew from the beginning, this was at least a 10 year commitment to try to get to a place where ticks weren't in every backyard and people could, you know, cause we really hear it on the east side, people saying, you know, I don't feel safe barbecuing. I don't feel safe going out in my backyard. And people have, you know, nice backyards that they feel like they can't use because they're so scared about 
you know, they just saw 13 deer walk through the, you know, an hour ago and, you know, the knowing about the ticks and everything. So it's, uh, it's definitely a challenging problem, but I think, you know, the, that's why the, the continued commitment is so important over a decade or so, you know. I, I do have a question. Um, it says in your presentation that 2,373 pounds of venison are delivered to, for donations. Mm -hmm. What's the process for that? Where do you get it? So um, I've neglected in my results to mention that point. I skipped over that the uh, removed deer do not go to waste. They are, uh, as part of our work with USDA, uh, they have a processing partner. Uh, the animal is properly uh, prepared and then brought to the, the meat is brought to the Central New York Food Bank that takes care of the uh, distribution of the meals that come from this work. A lot of venison oh. stories. It's called the Venison Donation Coalition and, and there is no cost to the city for that, which is nice. So I think, I believe the processor themselves have some kind of way to get reimbursed for that, but it's all part of, we, I do come to council for that contract, <laughs> just so you get, so when you see it, but um, it's been 31,000 meals over three years. Doesn't let me. No. Well, just <laughs> before we go close, I hope we get this under control because I want to buy a dog. <laughs> but I'm scared to buy a dog because of the, the ticks. The deer. Yeah, the deer. So, okay. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thank Thanks, everyone. You, you can always move to Eastwood. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get one. I keep looking. Got Thompson. We're out. Don't get there. Oh, we don't have much in Eastwood. No.